You're watching I-24 News, I'm Eamon Siksik. In this hour on I-24 News, we look back on three days in November 1977 that have changed the landscape of Israel and the region. The visit of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat polarized Israeli politics. His landing here was compared by both supporters and opponents to the landing of the first spaceman on the moon. The landmark visit was a major turning point that shattered old ideological dogmas. Public opinion was supportive of the move. Polls before and after Sadat's visit showed a dramatic shift in public opinion towards Egypt. But where do the Israeli regional plan and the Israeli public opinion stand today? During the next two hours, we will review the long-term political and social implications of that day. Forty years later, in November 2017, we'll go live to the Israeli parliament, the Knesset in Jerusalem, where our team is also standing by to elaborate on how Israel is marking the visit ignited, uh, that ignited one of the most important and lasting peace treaties in the region. With me now in studio is uh, Moshe Shachal, former Minister of Energy and Internal Security and Communication and it's Chak Levanon, former Israeli ambassador to Egypt. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me for Good this. Good evening. Uh, before we elaborate, and we have much to elaborate about uh, this hour, I want to begin by asking you first, you remember the euphoria around his visit, how many people said this will change Israel and Egypt's relations, maybe change the Middle East. Forty years later, are we where we thought we would be 40 years ago after his visit? Ambassador Levanon. I mean, I will give you, you know, my own feelings uh, at the time. It was m much more than euphoria, definitely. It was perceived as if the days of the Messiah are coming. Don't forget that we fought Egypt five wars. And suddenly you see the president of the state of uh, the Republic of Egypt, you know, descending the plane and coming to talk uh, peace uh, with the branch of Olive. So it was much more than a euphoria. Definitely, if I will go back in retrospect 40 years ago, and I see with ma what message he came to Israel, what was the expectations on both sides, and more specifically in Israel, and I will translate it to what it is now, the situation is not the same. And I would have, uh, you know, definitely I would have expected that things would go differently and completely, you know, in the other way. The only thing I can say that now that I'm looking back, I think that he left the political scene, he is Sadat, too early. So, Mr. Shachal, 40 years later, the Messiah didn't come? No, I think that he came. And I entirely agree, but I was a part of the excitement, of the euphoria, of whatever happened, in, uh, on two occasions. First of all, I was the chairman of the caucus of the Labour Party in the, in the opposition. And he wanted to meet with Golda Meir. Golda Meir was in New York, and uh, you didn't have the chance to meet with her. She's a formidable lady, and believe me, I was afraid of her whenever she talked to me. I was a young member of the Knesset. Many people say they were. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they, uh, um, they asked me that uh, President Sadat would like to meet with uh, Mrs. Meir. I called her in New York and I told her, uh, Golda, uh, um, Sadat is coming and he would like to meet with you. Uh, are you certain? I told her, yes, they told me so. No, no, call them again. There was no communication between Israel and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Egypt at that time. W with whom I, I, I can call. I told uh, Paris uh, what I'm going to do with her. He said, well, tell her that you talked with them. I said, no, no that was not right. I did it. I called her. I, I told her, Golda, I am sending you the tickets. Please come on this date. And she came. I arranged the meeting with uh, President Sadat. When he entered the room the, uh, of meeting with the uh, members of the, of the parliamentary party, and he met with Abba Evan, Golda Meir, um, uh, Yigal Alon, and... Uh, a picture sitting, I was third to him, and since we smoked a pipe, first thing that you do, we exchange the tobacco, from that time on, we became friends. A Sadat believed, believed, I think, that he was a religious person, 
that he is coming with the message of the Messiah, that he is going to complete the uh, Prophet Muhammad mission by adding or trying to bring the three religion to a sort of a coordination, peace, friendship. He proposed. And his so dream, monuments, his his dream, uh, his dream yes. he wanted to uh, have this kind of thing. So yes. it and is. Gentlemen, let's see how that message from Sadat is resonating still today in Israeli politics. And our correspondent Mike Wagenheim is joining us from uh, the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament in Jerusalem. Mike, we know an event is uh, taking place today. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and opposition leader Isaac Herzog are supposed to speak on this event to mark the occasion 40 years later. What more can you tell us about the ins and outs at the Knesset today? Well, there were several panel discussions held earlier on today, recognizing the role of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, in the peace agreement and, and focusing a lot on the durability of that peace agreement. Uh, really happiness that it's lasted, but a lot of uh, lamentation uh, that nothing really has been built upon that. There still is no uh, firm ties to much of the Arab world, although we're starting to see a little bit of drip drip from that as an Israeli minister uh, um, revealed some covert ties with Saudi Arabia a few days ago. But still no con no end to the conflict uh, in sight as far as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict goes. So while there's been a, a certain sense of pride uh, that, that uh, 40 years have gone by and no uh, conflict since with the Egyptians, uh, Yaakov Perry, the, uh, the ex-head of the Internal Security Service, the Shin Bet, and now a, a member of uh, parliament here of the centrist Yesha Tea Party, uh, really focused on how nothing has really been built upon that agreement. While there was euphoria, as your guest mentioned at the time, nothing really since then, and that has to change. Perry really focused on the role of Egypt now with President al-Sisi and really putting the ball in his court in fo as far as taking a lead and getting the Arab world to the table uh, to focus on stronger ties with Israel and to forge a true lasting peace not only between Egypt and Israel but the rest of the, uh, the region as well. Mike, thank you very much for joining us from the Knesset. You will be with us later uh, still uh, for more updates from there. Um, Ambassador Lebanon, um, we just heard from Mike that uh, there's disappointment that nothing really came of the visit. Well, nothing if you look in terms of peace with other Arab neighbors of Israel. Why is that? No, I don't think that this is uh, the real picture. Look, we have to be extremely meticulous, you know, when we are talking about this. So that came. He took the initiative, he was convinced. Because of mystical reasons, political reasons, economic reasons, military reasons, he wanted to do this step and he believed deeply, deep in his heart, that he can bring also all the Arab leaders. This is why before coming to Jerusalem, he went to Assad. The second point is, after coming to Israel and after you know, starting the negotiations, which were very, very hard negotiations, and reaching the peace, he indeed invests a lot of efforts in translating this peace into tangible things. At that time, I will remind you that you had a lot of uh, bilateral relations, agriculture, we had you know, the plant in Sinai, uh, we had uh, tourism, we had economy, we had a lot of things. Unfortunately, as I said before, he left the political scene too early, and when Mubarak came, and Mubarak was in the secret of everything, even when we went to Morocco, he was the one he knew that Moshe Dayan is going to meet with Tuhami. But Mubarak has a different agenda. And slowly, he says, look, the peace treaty, I cannot, I cannot, you know, cancel it. I cannot touch it. You have America, you have everybody. It is important, you know, for the military. But this doesn't mean that I have to kiss and hug the Israelis. And slowly we see during a long period of time, of three decades, that basically he emptied slowly what Sadat wanted to fill, you know, in the relationship. And on that peace treaty and how it's uh, evolved until today, I want to ask you, Mr. Shahal, but right after this very brief break, we're coming back in one minute. Stay with us.
politics, economics, business and technology. Get the real news and the real insight about what's happening around the world. Michelle McCory breaks down the top stories of the day from the Middle East to the U.S. Weeknights beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'm Jordana Miller at I-24 News. Join me for the Holy Land Uncovered, a look at this remarkable land filled with so much faith and history and archaeology. Watch Holy Land Uncovered every Sunday at 10.05 a.m. Eastern. Welcome back to this special edition on I-24 News. Looking back at the historic visit by Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president, here to Israel 40 years ago. Now let's take a look back at the background to Sadat's visit. It was the leader of the right, the now legendary Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who signed the peace agreement with Sadat and gave back in return the last grain of sand in Sinai conquered by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War with Egypt. More about the context of that historic visit in this report by Mike Wagenheim. It was an event so unbelievable, one of the main players thought it could be a hoax. Forty years later, it is still viewed as a turning point for the region. On November 19, 1977, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat landed at Lod Airport outside of Tel Aviv. Israel's current efforts to forge closer ties to the Arab world can be traced to Sadat's visit, the first by an Arab leader to Israel. The speech he gave at the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, is to this day credited with changing the geopolitics of the entire Middle East, opening the path for peace between Israel and its neighbors, and shaping a new agenda of political relations. Amazingly, the trip had been arranged less than one week earlier and would come about in the most public of ways. The United States was fruitlessly trying to arrange a peace conference in Switzerland when Sadat told American anchor Walter Cronkite that he'd like to head to Israel to address the parliament directly. I'm just waiting for the proper invitation. Uh, if you get that formal invitation, uh, how soon are you prepared to go? Uh, uh, really, I, I'm looking forward uh, uh, to fulfill this visit uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the earliest time possible. Having restored Egyptian and Arab pride four years earlier with victories in the earliest part of the Yom Kippur War, Egypt's second president had for years been making small gestures indicating that he might be interested in peace with the Jewish state, although nobody took him seriously at the time. Not true this time around. Later that same day, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin told Cronkite on live TV that the invitation was there and he'd personally go to meet Sadat at the airport. No back-channel talks, no diplomatic cable. Everything out there for the world to see and hear. Begin would address the Egyptian people over the air. There is no reason whatsoever for hostility between our peoples. In ancient times, Egypt and Eretz Israel were allies, real friends and allies against a common enemy from the north. Yes, indeed, many changes have taken place since those days, but perhaps the intrinsic basis for friendship and mutual help remains unaltered. Some in Begin's camp, though, thought it was too good to be true. When Sadat said in the parliament that he's going to the devil house to make peace and he meant Jerusalem, Israel, nobody believed him, not even the Egyptian. And when it came to us a few minutes later, we also did not believe. I remember him going out from the plane. You know, the chief of staff, Mordechai uh, Motagur, uh, said, I'm not sure what's going to happen. When the, the door will open, there will be about 70 Israeli paratroopers uh, 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 preparing to shoot who's coming up because he thought it was a bluff. It became reality, though, as Sadat stepped to the Knesset podium. The Egyptian president's visit to Jerusalem and his speech to the Knesset would serve as the start of a process that lasted 16 months before a peace treaty brokered by U.S. President Jimmy Carter was eventually signed by Begin and Sadat on the White House lawn in March of 1979. 
Mike Wagenheim, I-24 News. And we're going now to Jerusalem to bring into our conversation Herzl Makov, the president of the Menachem Begin Center. Uh, Mr. Makov, thank you very much for joining us from the Knesset in uh, Jerusalem. I want to discuss the Egyptian standpoint a little bit uh, with you. On Sadat's part, of course, this uh, entailed a lot of uh, bravery. It was a very bold move to come here and visit Israel in 1977. He was, of course, later assassinated. How has since then Egypt paid the price for this? Well, uh, we can see that since then, in its 40 years, so it's time that we can uh, uh, prove itself, uh, the peace uh, is still uh, existing between the two countries, and the security uh, interests of both countries are kept uh, very, very strongly, and we feel that uh, basically in Egypt uh, there is an understanding for this uh, deep interest of keeping uh, the peace. That's what brought the peace and that's what's keeping it for those many years. We also of course expected uh, mainly here in Israel to have a more warm relationship with the Egyptian people, but that didn't happen. And on the Israeli side, of course, this required also bravery and a bold move from uh, Prime Minister uh, Menachem Begin, uh, his willingness to uh, realize that mission. And we heard in that report a few m moments ago that there was still suspicion when the plane lands, there might be a terror cell in that plane uh, bringing Sadat to Israel. To what extent was there real fear here in Israel that this might explode? No, uh, it was uh, really an episode uh, because those people who were worried weren't part of the secret negotiations that took place before Sadat arrival. Sadat didn't arrive just like that uh, and surprised Israel. Menachem Begin started the process. He actually initiated uh, the process a few months earlier. In July, he uh, sent messages through uh, uh, Nicolae Ceausescu, then the president of Romania, to Sadat. Then he used the channel of the Iranian Shah, who was at the time uh, in good relationship with both Israel and Egypt. And then there were early negotiations between Moshe Dayan, the foreign minister of Israel, under Begin, uh, in Morocco, with Hassan Tuami, uh, minister from Egypt. Uh, and after that, Sadat came. But uh, those leaders, the political uh, level, didn't inform our intelligence uh, officers about the process. So uh, there, there was some misunderstanding, and there was really a, a warning that it might happen that instead of uh, President uh, Sadat coming out of the plane, we will see a group of commando, Egyptian commando, come out uh, of uh, the plane in this uh, uh, historical uh, moment. But of course it didn't happen and Sadat came and the story since then uh, known. Uh, Mr. Makov, uh, this is certainly a point we'll pick up on, on in studio today. Thank you very much for joining us from the Knesset. Uh, Mr. Shachal, before we go on break, I want to quickly touch on his point with you that this is not the peace Israel and Menachem Begin had imagined back then. Would you agree? No, on the formal uh, state, I think that we are now in the best relations with Egypt. Um, feeling together, they are. Uh, uh, working together on uh, uh, different issues, uh, especially security, etc. But what is lacking in, the, in this piece? It started with a lot of emotion, like it should be in the Middle East. But at the, at the uh, end, the meeting was with a different culture, a different attitude. I would say more as a Western country than a country in the Middle East. And I believe that 50% of the problems between Israel and the Arabs is based on not understanding and appreciating the culture of the Arabs. We'll break that down right after this break. Quick one and we'll be back again. Stay with us.
It is easy to have misconceptions about the Middle East. Quand on vient faire son métier de reporter ici, c'est pas pour faire la figuration. On évolue dans une région sensible où chaque mot compte. It would be easy to settle for just one point of view. يهمني أمر تعدد الثقافات. I've always seen a sort of misunderstanding of this region. In the most sensitive area of the world, we work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no room for mistakes. We want to make sure that the viewers get the full picture from all angles and break down the complexity of all these issues affecting us. Our duty is to show the whole picture. C'est sans doute le meilleur endroit pour analyser et décoder l'actualité internationale. To explore all the angles. Telling the precise story, just the facts, nothing else. To tell you the whole story. وجهات النظر المختلفة الأراء المتضاربة أحيانا تجعلنا نقدم أفضل المعلومات. To give a voice to all the players. C'est mettre en valeur la liberté d'expression. This is much, much bigger than any of us. I24 News. See beyond. What you need to know, the news, fast and to the point, and the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat from the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown, co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David, every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. the special edition on I-24 News. How did Anwar Sadat's visit to Israel resonate within the halls of the Israeli parliament? Some leading members of Knesset reflect on that day and its complicated meaning 40 years later. Take a look. My mother was born in Egypt, in Ismailia. Her father was the chief engineer of the Suez Canal. And she then grew up in Cairo. And we always, she always spoke about her childhood in Egypt. And I was asked, is there any possibility we'll ever visit Egypt? It was clear to us it will never happen. It was a, a Saturday, and we, the, it, uh, we were fixated at home in the apartment of the ambassador as to uh, the landing of Sadat, and we saw it live, and my parents wept, simply wept. It was awesome. My father was like a tough army general, was extremely moved by this. And then he gets a phone call from Menachem Begin, just after it all started. And Begin instructs him and tells him that it was agreed that the first contact between the two governments will be done between the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and the Egyptian ambassador to the United Nations. So it was Chaim Herzog and Ismat Abdel Magid. Mm -hmm. Magid later became foreign minister and my father hosted him in the president's home as president of Israel for dinner and it was a very moving event. They became friends in two minutes. No one was in the streets. Everyone was sitting in front of the television to watch this historic visit and the speech in parliament. I remember that moment as if it were, well, right now. It was a Saturday night and I was sitting there with a the transistor radio doing military basic training. I had been called up in November, and I remember they were taking us to a lecture. We were supposed to get a lecture, they took us all, and there's me with the transistor, and I'm listening to it. And I remember standing up and just shouting out, guys, guys, Sadat has landed. Guys, Sadat has landed. Back to our studio discussion now with Yitzhak <laughs> Lebanon and Moshe Shachal. And Ambassador Lebanon, we hear these very beautiful memories from uh, members of Knesset today about how their childhood uh, painted that visit romantically almost. Uh, Isaac Herzog saying that his parents wept. But I wonder how was the Sadat visit perceived in Egypt with his whole doctrine of openness and opening up also to Israel. Was there the same euphoria in Egypt seeing him visit here? Uh, look, uh, uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, Minister Shachal says that they had something in common between him and Sadat, and this is the pipe. Sadat used to go in the garden alone with his pipe. Before coming to Jerusalem, he went to his native village, Umm al and with his pipe, and he surprised everybody, including his own people. I think that only one or two people maximum in Egypt knew that he is going to do 
such a giant step. When he came, he took with him the people who supported him and not the people who did not. Like uh, Ahmad Fahmi, for instance, you know, he was the foreign minister. Other ministers, the chief of staff, they resigned. After his visit to Jerusalem, when he went back to Cairo, he was received by thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And it was really something that everybody sought and, and were, you know, convinced that he has the full support. But um, in my mind, this was a temporary situation because immediately it changed because of the Syrians, because of the front of refusal, because of the Arab League, because of the Muslim Brotherhood, because of part of the, of the, of the uh, media, because of all these ministers who have resigned because they were against him. So suddenly we saw that slowly we saw a growing uh, criticism and opposition to the steps that Sadat taken, but he had to deal with this, and I think that he dealt with this successfully. So is it fair to say that Sadat's visit here, the uh, corresponding peace treaty with Israel, in a way also encouraged uh, vicariously the radicalization of Egyptian politics after him? No, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that what he did was accepted by, the, by his people with really a, a great support, spontaneous. For example, visiting uh, Egypt after the peace treaty together with the President Yitzhak Navon. I was there, the only politician. <coughs> and we went, I went with a judge from Nazareth, Kteli, Mohammed Kteli, in the streets of Cairo, without bodyguards. And the people knew that we are Israelis, and they came. We did have the, the best hosting opportunity uh, directly. Things happened. Don't forget that, in a way, the United States didn't accept this treaty very easily because President it wasn't Carter. part of it. Secondly, he has... I asked President Sarat at the time, in the, in the meeting, we, before having the lunch with President Navon, we sat men only, Sadat, Mubarak, Sufi Abu Talib, the chairman of the uh, Egyptian parliament, Ishaq Navon and I. We spoke Arabic, all five of us. And I asked him a question. I told him, you see, Arat uh, sir, Mr. President, I, uh, you went, before coming to Jerusalem, you went to visit Hafez al-Assad, the president of, but the other Arab leaders you went to see them only after you came to Jerusalem. Now, he laughed, his very famous laugh, he, with all the, he said, oh, this is a good question. Only Assad could interfere and uh, undermine the project. So I went to him and I told him, come with me. The Golan in my pocket, in, in, in uh, uh, Egyptian Arabic, he said, El Golan Figebi. That is to say that I have the Golan. Come with me. Assad told him, no, I don't believe them. But if you want to go, Allah ma'ad, go God with you. So he faced a lot of opposition, but still that managed to go through. There's more you will share with us. Right after this break, you will, I promise. Another break and we'll be back. Politics has its own set of rules. In Israel and beyond, public figures play an elaborate game of cat and mouse with the media. We'll break it all down for you with our all-star panel of movers and shakers. The Spin Room with Ami Kaufman, Sunday to Thursday at 8.05 p.m. Eastern. News 24 is the magazine semanal de noticias y análisis en español de I24 News. Mi nombre es Carlos Gurovich y conmigo en el estudio Damián Pachter y Anib Azulay. Analizaremos todo lo que pasa en Israel y el Medio Oriente. También pondremos nuestra mirada en el mundo hispanoparlante. News 24 es el magazine semanal en español todos los viernes solo en I24 News.
welcome back. We're going to take a perspective from Egypt now and a special look at how the Egyptian leader's visit is remembered in Egypt by his nephew, Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat. The first part of two of that interview that we're going to show you in this report. At the end of the 1940s, when he was involved in some of the youth groups that were against British colonialism and monarchy, he was expelled from the army, imprisoned, and escaped from prison. He had a life full of struggle. He was one of the most prominent members of the 1952 Revolution Command Council, which exercised political action before the revolution, which also had national positions. Visiting Jerusalem, as I see it, was a very courageous step, and we now see everyone trying to achieve what Sadat achieved through the war and his negotiations during peace. I do not see people always fighting. Wars, despite their losses, end peacefully. This is what we have seen in all wars in Europe and America. People do not fight for the rest of their lives. And former Israeli ambassador Shlomi Hillel is one of few who saw that historic visit in real time. I-24 News put the question of the meaning of that visit for Israel to Hillel. Here's what he told us. Well, I realize it's a kind of a change in history. I mean, we have been expecting, undoubtedly even before, that we are going to have some kind of relationship with the neighboring Arab countries. But the idea that the president of the greatest uh, Arab country of Egypt will come to the Knesset and address the Knesset members, which means that he recognizes the state of Israel, the Jerusalem, the Knesset in Jerusalem. I think that that was a really, really very courageous move that has been done by Sadat. And I believe that this has been a changing point in, in, in our relationship with, with the whole of the Arab world. His speech was a very courageous one. He spoke openly. And I, I believe that he, he managed to get from the people of Israel the feeling that he's speaking from the bottom of his heart. Mm -hmm. So the people of, I mean, he had to change the moods in the mind of the people of, of Israel. And his speech, even before that, his arrival to the Ben Gurion airport before that, and I was there too, this gave the feeling, the feeling to the people of Israel that he is speaking from the bottom of his heart and he is meaning whatever he said. He said some harsh words, but he said it openly and clearly and in a very decent way. Back to our studio panel now. And Ambassador Levanon, both you and uh, you Minister. You wanted to ask him, uh, Shaka, he wanted to. He had to complete a know. point. Let's Please. do that. Yes. Uh, well, um, the, the main point is that I was a minister of energy afterwards. 50% of our oil, crude oil, came from Egypt. Even during the time when we had the Lebanese first war with, the, with Lebanon and the beginning of Hezbollah, Egypt continued to sell us crude oil. And I was on the best terms with President Mubarak when he decided that he is going to sell natural gas to Israel. So on this, let us say, uh, items, the peace has proved itself. And Sadat changed the Middle East. No question about that. That after the visit of Sadat to Israel, the Middle East is not the same again. The problem is that there were problems that we didn't understand. We are still not understanding in Israel. No, learning the language, it's understanding the culture, behaving as a part of the Middle East and not like a Western country is very necessary and more than all, solving the Palestinian problem. We can have a harmony of living together as good neighbors and I think that it was started by, by Sadat. Last point, Mr. Lebanon, uh, you mentioned both of you uh, the visit by Sadat to Hafez Assad, the Syrian president, before he came here. Obviously, there was ob objection in the Arab world, and the psychological barrier at that point was maybe that no Arab state should um, enter a peace treaty with the Jewish state. Was that psychological barrier broken, looking back today? By Sadat, yes. In the eyes of Sadat, yes. 
practically speaking, if I will talk about the Israeli side, yes. The proof is that we had contacts and we reached a peace treaty. This has been, uh, you know, able only uh, when he broke, you know, this uh, psychological barrier. The problem, the fundamental problem was that Sadat and Assad went together into the Yom Kippur War. And Sadat was convinced that, like in time of war, I can bring Assad in terms of peace, but he didn't realize that Assad has a different agenda. Sadat, believe us, Assad, no. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me with this vital perception from Sadat's visit and vital perception into the future. Thank you very much thank for you. being with me for this. Now let's go live to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament in Jerusalem, where the event to mark this occasion is about to start. And now, however, this promise, where in a sense it was also a blessing, did not come true. From the day the state was established, we have seen many times the Egyptians in various places where they have a common denominator, all were a battlefield. Again and again, IDF soldiers had to face soldiers and tanks that came from the Sinai Desert. The list of battles between us and Egypt was engraved deeply in our national memory. Protecting the Erot Yitzchak in the Independence War, the Six-Day War, the ongoing battles of the War of Attrition, and many others. Four years prior to the historic visit of Sadat to Israel, once again IDF soldiers saw the Egyptian soldiers via their binoculars. There were bloody battles of Yom Kippur as well. Sadat himself, he and no one else, was the commander-in-chief of the enemy army that broke the Barlev line, caused many, many injuries to the IDF and threatened to conquer Israel. On this historical background, is this a wonder that the chief of staff, Motagul, feared that Sadat is coming to Israel to harm us? Is it a wonder that he was still hearing in his ears the threats from Cairo and he warned Begin, the prime minister at the time, that in the airplane soldiers are hiding and the entire thing is but a mere display. It is no wonder if we take into account the regular rules of diplomacy. However, as I said in the beginning of my remarks, Sadat's visit to Israel was not following regular rules and decorum. It broke everything. It broke the rule that states whatever was happening in the history is going to continue. He twisted the iron sword that we thought is going to be in our hands forever. And Prime Minister Begin answered similarly. He uh, paid a visit to Cairo after signing the peace agreement and gave to Sadat a copy of an ancient sword that was found in Israel. It was a unique sword, and it was found twisted in the shape of a circle facing and marking that using the sword is over now. This was a symbol that using a sword between us and Egypt, between Israel and Egypt, is done and over with. Members of the Knesset, Mr. Prime Minister, dear guests, the visit of the President of Saadat to Israel 40 years ago was a very important milestone. However, it is not the end of things. It's true amongst the Egyptian leaders and Israeli leaders, a peace agreement was signed. However, did the citizens on both sides sign a peace? Do we have peace? It's true that governments are cooperating from time to time out in the open and sometimes discreetly. However, are citizens on the Israeli part and Egyptian part cooperating? Unfortunately, 40 years later, the answer is not yet. And today, I want us to mark the next goal on this very long way to peace. Let's aspire to bend the sword a bit more. Let's try and expand those realms from government to the public. 
from leaders. There is no reason for which hotels will not be filled with tourists and vice versa. There is no reason for us to depend on cooperation in agriculture, in culture, innovation. There is no reason for us not to continue with the vision that started here in the Israeli parliament 40 years ago. What happened then does not have to mark how things will turn out in the future. Members of the Knesset, this vision has other dimensions, broader than the Egyptian topic. In the scroll of independence, the state of Israel stated that it is reaching out in peace and good neighbor to all neighboring countries. The event that we are mentioning and marking today is an opportunity to say that this statement still holds true. We are still reaching a hand to peace to all our neighbors. And from this podium, as Speaker of the Knesset, I'm saying very clearly, my colleagues, the speakers of the parliaments in Arab countries, you are invited. Anyone who is brave enough to take one step forward to recognize the uh, right of existence of the State of Israel and would like to speak here in the Israeli parliament will find our door open, open not only to rushing towards a peace agreement, but also any beginning of a process. It's open for building trust, it's open for a mutual discussion of the real interest of citizens of all countries. Perhaps we won't be able to ultimately reach agreements. It is possible, however, do not fear. Don't fear such a visit. No one will lose. Well, at least you would enjoy a very good cup of coffee here in the Israeli parliament, and I'm calling the leaders of the neighboring countries, follow Anwar Sadad and Menachem Begin, for the last time, take your sword out, but not in order to attack, rather in order to twist it and make it inapplicable once and for all. I'm calling now the Prime Minister of Israel, member of the Knesset, Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes, that was Speaker of the Knesset, Yuri Alistin, making that speech, marking the 40 years since the incident. Yes, let's take a listen now to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making his remarks on 40 years since Anwar Sadat's visit to Israel. Distinguished Speaker of the Knesset, Mr. Yuri Edelstein, members of the government, the head of opposition, member of Knesset Yitzhak Herzog, dear guests, I just now met with the ambassador of Egypt to Israel, Chazem Khairat, and his team, and he gave us regards from the Egyptian President Assisi and the Foreign Minister Shakin. I also congratulated him in light of this important event. The peace between Israel and Egypt is standing strong and it is for the benefit of both countries. And at the same time, it really is a sorry sight to see such a meek presence. So few people are present here in this event and we'll have to do something to correct it. Maybe when we mark the 50th year anniversary for the visit. However, I'm sure that we're going to have some opportunities before that. And perhaps one of the reasons is that we got accustomed to it maybe too fast, it became a sort of a routine, a given. But it is not a given. And I do remember the excitement that was sweeping the citizens of Israel, myself, and people from the world. It was the arrival of Sadat, his coming to Israel and then coming to the Knesset, to the Israeli parliament. The same excitement that I felt when Sadat visited was just like seeing the first person on the moon. It is like a pioneering, it is a trailblazing towards the future. In those 40 minutes of covering the distance from Egypt to Israel, 
He simply changed history, and it was shorter than the 40 years of the Israeli people going through the Sinai Desert, but not less dramatic to ancient people who crossed ways in ancient times already, two neighboring countries who, many, who have, were in war with each other for many, many years. They managed to overcome hostility and to reach out a hand in peace. Sadat's visit was a breakthrough in the history of the Middle East. It enabled a direct contact between the Arab world and the Jewish state and brought about a historical peace, the first, the very first of its kind. Time shows us that this peace is a very stable anchor in our bloody and our turmoil area. It is true, maybe this is not a perfect sort of peace, but it definitely pays off to both countries, not only to us. Despite crises, despite all sorts of shocks along the way, it is a sustainable peace. However, there is a fundamental condition for peace. It was always a condition, and this is the strength of Israel. In the Middle East, Alliances are done with a strong one, not with the weak one. Sadat said when he came here, I came to make peace with a strong leader. That's his word. And he was convinced before coming to Jerusalem that Israel has a lot of strength. Since the War of Independence, the IDF managed any attack, even surprise attacks, and maintained the security of the state of Israel, the importance of the Iron Wall was proven over and over again, not only in order to keep us safe and keep our existence, but also in order to create the leverage for peace with our neighbors. And only with a strong Israel, we can first of all reach a state of no war, and from that state reach peace, peace which brings recognition of the state of Israel and prevents bloodshed in the future. Menachem Begin said it in a few sentences. No more war, no more bloodshed. But you also want to take it a step further towards peace. And Anwar Sadat, standing here on this podium, in a very moving state, he said, I declared more than once that Israel is an existing fact, meaning, first of all, recognizing the fact of existence, out of which there is a recognition and understanding due to this existence, because of that. And so we have to be strong enough all the time so that there is no doubt regarding our permanent existence. This is what Sadat did, unlike our Palestinian neighbors who until today refuse to recognize the right of existence for the state of Israel. And I'm sorry to have to say that I have yet to come across a Palestinian Sadat who will declare his will to end this conflict. I know what you're thinking, I know, I know. I have yet to meet a Palestinian Sadat who will declare his will for the end of the conflict, will recognize the state of Israel in uh, any borders, and will support our right to live in peace. Today, four decades after Sadat's visit to Israel, very broad portions of the Arab world understand very well not only what occurred here 40 years ago, but they understand thoroughly what could happen here due to the changes that are happening in this region. Many countries know that the threat on the Middle East is not coming from Israel, but vice versa. Israel is the moderate factor. It is the responsible 
but also the very insistent one to fight this threat. The large threat over this region is coming from the extreme and violent Islam, supported by Iran on the one hand and ISIS on the other hand. This extreme Islam, which is trampling over everything in its way. President Saadat himself was a victim of this uh, Islamic extremist. And his murder in Cairo 36 years ago shocked the world. At the same time, peace remained standing still. Peace with Egypt knew its ups and downs. However, it managed to go through all obstacles at the time of Mubarak. And even after that. In recent years, our relationship with Egypt, led by the President Assisi, this peace and these relationships are having a better time. We have open relationships, which is vital for the security of Israel as well as for the security of Egypt. The last visit in New York where I have met with the uh, president of Egypt, strengthened these relationships. We are committed to expand the circle of peace to other countries and to our Palestinian neighbors as well. I know that President Trump and his team are committed to reach this goal. The greatest obstacle for expanding peace nowadays is not in the leaders of the countries around us. The obstacle lies in the public opinion. On the Arab street, a public opinion which was brainwashed for years by a faulty representation of the state of Israel. And after many decades of years, it's like ge uh, geological layers. It's very difficult to now present Israel in the real light with a beautiful face and the true face of Israel, the help that we uh, provide, whether it's in the, this region, in Africa, Asia, in delegations that we said, that we send, and technology assisting people who are injured in Syria, thousands and thousands. It's very difficult to penetrate those layers and layers and reach the bottom of the truth. And so peace remains a cold peace. And I say, better have a cold peace than a hot war. But better a hot peace than a cold peace. And we all want it. And so this perception, this view of Israel must be changed. Otherwise it will be very difficult to break the circle of Palestinians because within them there is ongoing incitement, not only in Judea and Samaria with the Palestinian Authority, but also in Gaza, all the time. They have propaganda going on, and you ask yourself, don't they know the truth? They live here. But this cover, this framework of propaganda is so strong, the layers, layer upon layer, lie upon lie, they're so powerful, and this prevents making a breakthrough. And this must be changed. And I see changes, I see buds, I see beginnings of this change in the public opinion. I'm not talking about the leaders now. In the Arab region, we see certain changes in certain parts of the public opinion in the Middle East. And I think this should be encouraged, this should be developed further in this region because ultimately it will reflect inside. And when I talk about peace from the outside inwards, it is this ability to leverage our connections with Arab countries in order to break this Palestinian obstacle. It has to do more with awareness changing it bit by bit, that Israel is different. And we have to adjust the narrative, the Palestinian narrative. We have, it has to be adjusted to the truth. 
We have to look at it differently with an objective eye, with a truthful eye. Look at the real Israel. I would like to see peace with Egypt being adjusted to this truth. Expand our contacts, the live contact between the people in economy and culture and tourism to break this wall. This wall of propaganda, this historical propaganda. And I hope that we are in the beginning of this process, at least according to what we are measuring. We see it happening in certain parts of the area. Mm, well, not everything is given to us naturally, immediately, and change, if happens, would take more time. However, there is no doubt we are in the right time for expanding cooperation, for breaking stereotypes. Peace is important for Israel. Peace is important for the Palestinians. Peace is important for the Arab nations and important for Egypt, of course. Anwar Sadat's visit to Israel 40 years ago taught us that in our region, the impossible can turn and become a reality. And this is why I believe with all my heart that this great occurrence is not going to be a mere episode, but is going to remain the cornerstone for building peace in the Middle East in this generation and the future generations. And for uh, the honor that this visit deserves, I'm asking you, the Speaker of the Knesset, to set a special meeting to mark 41 years for the arrival of Anwar Sadat to the State of Israel and the Israeli Parliament. He deserves it, he is worthy of it, and so are we. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. לגבי הערתו של ראש הממשלה, רק לידיעת חברי הכנסת, שלא נחשוב שמתקיים איזה כנס חשוב בחוץ, עוד עשרות חברים נמצאים בבניין, פשוט מתחת ל... Yes, that was uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking at the event in the Knesset, uh, marking 40 years since the visit of Anwar Sadat to Israel in the Knesset. That historic visit we're also marking here in this two-hour broadcast. And uh, with me in studio now are Dr. Chaim Kuren, former Israeli ambassador to Egypt, and Professor Eli Podeh from the Department of Islam and Middle Eastern Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Um, Dr. Kuren, I want to begin with you. We heard... Uh, uh, the Prime Minister is saying uh, it's a cold peace between Israel and Egypt. This is not what Israel or Egypt wanted at the time, but the Prime Minister related this to incitement and public opinion uh, within Egypt. Uh, it's a very unique treaty indeed. It's a very unique peace treaty. Formally, it's standing. Everything that was agreed upon seems to be still in line. But he is right in making that point that public opinion in Egypt hasn't changed much towards Israel. Some would say changed for the worse. Why? You know, in, in our area, in our region, the Middle East, if you don't have patience, it's very difficult to live in. So uh, we need a lot of patience. Processes are taking a lot of time. Now, to move sharply from a situation of war to uh, the contrary uh, a process of peace, it's uh, changing the state of mind for many people. Now, that's not uh, true that uh, uh, there's no changes in the Egyptian popular mind. Because during my <clears throat> time in Egypt, I could see uh, publics that are uh, rejecting the peace. But it's not the same uh, like it used to be. And the very fact, if you compare the original uh, reality 40 years ago, to what's going on now. Just yesterday, there was the gathering of change in public opinion. There are some still uh, large sections that maybe would not want contact with Israel on a regular basis. And Professor Podet, the uh, Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, related this to incitement in his speech now. And of course, taking the Palestinian example too, saying that this is why we cannot have Israel, cannot have peace with the Palestinians. There's so much incitement. He said, I haven't 
yet met a Palestinian Sadat, so there is no leader uh, to go about this peace treaty with, according to the prime minister. But to what extent is the Palestinian issue stopping peace between Israel and Egypt becoming an all-out peace like both countries had originally planned? Well, um, I think that we cannot say that everything depends on the Palestinian issue. However, it is a very important factor, no doubt. Uh, I've met uh, many Egyptians along the way, you know, in conferences and so on. And I'm always interested, and I'm asking them, why it is this relationship, you know, as we call them, called peace? And usually the answer is very simple solve the Palestinian issue. So again, I'm not saying that this is the sole issue because it's connected with uh, many other issues as well. Uh, you have to understand that uh, many of them, not the younger generation, as uh, Chaim said, but uh, the old generation, they still have a certain image. And this image, by the way, is transmitted not only in the media, but also in the Egyptian textbooks. So uh, in the education system. So this is something that is very significant and it takes a long time to change. However, I do believe that in the long run it will change, but we have also to take responsibility for the situation. I mean, we cannot say that it's only as a result of the Egyptian behavior, but certain things that we do, especially in the realm of the conflict, contributes a lot to the tension that exists sometimes. But at the same time, we have to remember that the current situation, the present relationship is uh, very good, even excellent. And on that point of the evolving relations between uh, Israel and Egypt, gentlemen, watch this report with me by our diplomatic correspondent, Eli Hochenberg, on how Israeli-Egyptian relations evolved in those 40 years. And we'll come back to the studio and continue discussion. Take a look. I'm proud that our two nations have been at peace for nearly four decades through storms, turbulence, earthquakes. We have remained in peace and we shall remain in peace. Four decades since the unconvincible became a reality, it's difficult to imagine the regional strategy of both Israel and Egypt without one another. Uh, traditionally, for Arab states on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, it was easy. You side with the Palestinians, it's natural and consistent. Uh, suddenly, Egypt finds itself in a different uh, situation. Uh, through um, convergence, of a security interest at the highest level. Egypt realized that it has to make sure that it doesn't get stuck between Israel and the Palestinians. Siding with the Palestinians might risk undermining the strategic security cooperation. Siding with the Israelis will bring the wrath of the entire Arab world and the Egyptian street. So when they have to balance the two, the best thing to do is try to bring the two into some kind of harmony. And indeed, balancing it seems to be key. In a first ever interview, Egypt's Israel envoy, Ambassador Hazem Khairat, told I-24 News that the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty has proven that peaceful relations are able to overcome all challenges. And here comes the but. Accordingly, it is important to emphasize the concept of peace as the only means to have normal relations between the peoples of the region. When Egypt pushed its bid for the UN Security Council, they had these pamphlets saying Egypt was the architect of peace, and it was part of the campaign, part of the branding of Egypt, a country that can be a center of stability, which has a respected international role and involvement with Israel, is part of it. The state of Israel is perceived as an anchor of stability and strength here in the region, and it can help Saudi Arabia and Egypt provide the solutions to threats. Therefore, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Jordan have a clear interest in preserving this connection with Israel. It will, however, be much more convenient for them to make it visible if there were progress in the process vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Although, as far as I can see, it's only lip service. The Palestinian issue no longer interests the Arab world as it did in the past. The mood in the Arab world, quite consistently, uh, is that it is not legitimate to legitimize business with Israel before justice is done to the Palestinians. Now, 
it's not uniform. And it's not, you know, one size fits all. It's not. Some feel it very deeply. Some just feel that they have to go through the motions. But even those who have to go through the motions have to go through the motions. In diplomacy, it's even more rigid uh, because the Arab world doesn't need Israeli diplomacy. What they need of Israel is other things. And this is happening over the last few years under the table, under the radar. Yet there's also another thing happening under the radar. If one looks at the public discourse in Egypt, as it appears in the press, it can be said that peace with Israel is in itself legitimate and the more complex question is normalization and warm peace. Here, there is still no legitimacy in public opinion for an extensive relationship with broad economic and cultural ties. But there is legitimacy to argue about it. There are articles for and against. It's no longer taboo. Only 40 years ago, the image of an Egyptian president marching to the podium of the Israeli parliament seemed more far-fetched than anything else. The prospects of it happening again? Dreams can be realized, Ambassador Khairat told us, but he added it is important to pave the way for realizing dreams by working towards reaching a solution. Turning dreams into reality, this is something the Egypt-Israel relationship had already proved capable of doing. Eli Hachenberg, I-24 News. Yes, let's cross now live to Jerusalem. Our correspondent Mike Wagenheim is there at the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, for us reporting. And Mike, at this point, we heard the prime minister and speaker of the Knesset, Yuli Edelstein, speaking. Both made some very, uh, some would say, controversial points. Yuli Edelstein uh, inviting leaders of er other Arab states around Israel to also do the same move that uh, Sadat did. How are these speeches resonating in the Knesset today? Well, the, the Prime Minister made a, a somewhat sad point when you look around the uh, the plenum where these speeches are being held today, and I had a bird's eye view uh, looking down, uh, it, it's fairly empty. Just uh, a few members of uh, Knesset, the Israeli parliament, are in attendance, some distinguished guests, but when you saw the wide shots of the plenum, uh, there just isn't a whole lot of interest, and uh, the Prime Minister went on to mention how it's almost taken for granted now. Now, in a way, that's good that 40 years have gone by and people are starting to take for granted uh, the Israeli-Egyptian peace. That means it's sunk in, it's held, and that, that's a wonderful thing in and of itself. The Prime Minister, however, went on to, went on to point out uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, the main thing now is to build on that, and that's really been one of the failures of the uh, the, the treaty and the follow-up is that really there's been no, no permanent peace with the Arab world, no permanent peace or even anything close to it uh, with the Palestinian Arabs and the Palestinian Authority, and that speaks to uh, the, the Knesset Speaker uh, uh, Edelstein's point that the Arab world needs to get more involved in the uh, in the peace process and uh, he reached out and welcomed them to the Knesset as, as the Prime Minister did and that's really been more um, the substance of the speeches by the Prime Minister and the Knesset speaker is yes this was a historic moment 40 years ago yes it was something wonderful yes it's held what are we going to do from here and that's really more of what they focused on and, and I think that's been a, a theme throughout the coalition today with foreign uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Tsipi Khodaveli made the same point. We have to have somebody now on the other side, whether it's El Sisi, whether somebody steps up in the Palestinian Authority, whether somebody steps up somewhere else in the Arab world to really have a true partner uh, to make a lasting peace. And that, that's been the theme from the coalition today. That was the point also made by the Prime Minister, Mike, that uh, how to turn cold peace into warm peace. How would that look like, warm peace, from what you hear in the Knesset? Uh, I made, made the point in the studio earlier is that it, this is a generational thing. It's centuries, centuries of animosity uh, between uh, Egyptians and, and the Jewish people and after the uh, formation of the State of Israel, decades of, of animosity finally leading to this treaty. All that anger, all that hostility doesn't go away even in 40 years. It's only been one or two generations. So it is a process and it is going to take time. And I think, uh, as he said, you got to have patience around here. Mike Wagenheim will certainly have patience. Thank you very much for joining us from the Knesset again. And we're going to continue the discussion here in studio right after this short break. Stay with us.
Every stone, every street, every scar tells the story of Israel. A place that speaks of the souls of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Changed by time and conflicted, its magic still echoes in the hearts of its people. Join I-24 News' Jordana Miller on a journey through history. Watch Holy Land Uncovered every Sunday at 10.05 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to this special on I-24 News. Now, a follow-up on a perspective from Egypt we showed you in the first hour. A special look at how the Egyptian leader's visit uh, here in Israel is remembered in Egypt by his nephew, Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat. The second part of that interview in this report. The Camp David Accords, which some criticize, gave us back our whole land without spilling one drop of blood or losing a military officer. What more do they want? All of Sinai, from Taba to the city of Suez, is under Egyptian sovereignty, and we have many projects taking place there. When we found terror in Sinai, we sent the military and weapons. Then there is no problem in the agreement. When talking about the Arab project, President Sadat failed. He exhausted all efforts to achieve Arab unity, but he found no success from his attempts. He found out that they all have their own interests and are engaged in secret negotiations. It was necessary for him to take a position because he was responsible for his people. 60 to 70 million he was responsible for. He had to start moving in order to preserve his people and his future and the future of the new generations. All this was confirmed after his death. The wars in the region, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Libya, and even the Arabian Gulf became a matter of concern. Unfortunately, leaders of the Arab world need to be honest with themselves. Back to our studio discussion now. And Dr. Koren, listening to Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat talking about the Arab leaders need to uh, wake up, so to speak. There was a huge psychological barrier when Sadat visited Israel, the first Arab leader. Forty years later, have we moved on? Have we broken that barrier? As I said before, it's a matter of a process. We uh, need to overcome a lot of obstacles here. And whether it starts unofficially, unofficially in talks behind the scene or common interest or uh, due to the changing reality, the, the new connections that we couldn't think of four decades ago, now that probably will bring the interest to be on the front line as long as it goes away, goes well with the Arab interests as well. Because whether if Egypt uh, defines its uh, national security as working for stability in, domestically in Egypt and in the region and uh, uh, developing the economy, that goes very well together with, with Israel, as well as Jordan, as well as the Emirates. So it's a matter of time that we should overcome some obstacles. We mentioned here some of them was the main, the Palestinian issue, that as you well aware, the Egyptians working very hard in order to, to bridge the gaps, firstly within the Palestinian community and later on between the Palestinians as a faction, one faction, and Israel. And uh, uh, by the time, maybe we can all come together, the one coalition working together for some uh, same ideas. Uh, and that is probably will bring together uh, all the parts to sit down and maybe establish it formally later on. And in order for that to happen, uh, Professor Podet, do you think it's fair to say that it's hard to imagine an Israeli leader today, in this case Benjamin Netanyahu, but maybe any other, answering the call that Menachem Begin answered from Sadat, taking that move together with an Arab leader, an Arab neighbor? Yeah. Well, interesting question. First of all, let me say that Sadat himself said that the conflict, 70%, is psychological. So he said him, himself. And also, in a comparison, you know, or in response to things that were said in the Knesset, um, we have to remember that Sadat, he made a precedent. And the thing is that today, every one of us, 
and certainly every Israeli leader is measuring the conduct or the behavior of early leaders in comparison to Sadat. So they're expecting them, you know, to come and to offer and to visit uh, Jerusalem. And that is not the case. So I think, I mean, uh, my humble opinion is that that is not going to happen. But there are other options or there are other possibilities. And you can further the peace without actually coming to Jerusalem or actually going to the Arab League. I don't know if all of us remember, but uh, Olmert at a certain point was, um, there was a suggestion that they will come to the Arab League in 2007. So going back to your question, to what extent Netanyahu is going to go in that direction, it seems that he is not going to follow. So that uh, direction, but um, you know they might be surprises. I cannot negate the possibility. I mean, many people were very much against Begin and the fact that you know the head of the Likud coming to power, and he wanted very much to show everybody, and he said it himself. He said, "I'm going to show them that I'm the one who's going to bring peace eventually." So you never know. Well, gentlemen, let's bring in a view from uh, Egypt as well. We're joined in this conversation by Sean David Hobbs from Cairo, a freelance journalist. Uh, Sean, thank you very much for joining our conversation. And Sean, we talked about uh, throughout this broadcast about how Israel is marking 40 years since Sadat visited. We saw those speeches by the Prime Minister and uh, Speaker of Parliament uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, to what extent are those, um, we could say, events or celebrations in Israel mirrored in Egypt, or do we see an entirely different picture today? I think you see somewhat of a different take on, um, on Sadat's visit. Uh, clearly, uh, this was a landmark decision for an Arab leader to go to, to, go to Israel. Um, and uh, and everyone realizes that. But the legacy of Sadat is very much tied to uh, the present uh, leadership uh, and, and that of President Sisi. And uh, so I think when a lot of Egyptians look at this, they, they look at, uh, at least Egyptians I've spoken to, uh, have kind of two views. Uh, and, they, and they conflate those views also with how they, they look at, at, at the president, uh, the present president. So... Uh, there, the one view is that uh, he was a, you know, a great leader uh, and that he reclaimed the Sinai Peninsula for Egypt, um, and that was a, a great victory. But that isn't everyone. Some people feel that uh, his actions uh, were brought Egypt too close to the United States, um, and so they're, 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 it, it's a mixed bag, um, but clearly uh, more, generally more of the supporters of President Sisi now tend to uh, tend to agree with the with the former view of uh, of president Sadat's trip to uh, to Israel whereas uh, more of the detractors um, of uh, president Sisi tend to uh, tend to go in the other direction and feel um, uh, yeah uh, more of a, a negative view about his his trip to uh, to Israel Yes, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, Sean David Hobbs, for joining us from Cairo. We are going to still continue discussing the views in Egypt and in Israel 40 years after that visit. But as always, right after this quick break, stay with us. We'll be right back. the headlines every day on I-24 News. Host Ami Kaufman talks to the news makers and pundits to bring you the story behind the headlines. The Spin Room with Ami Kaufman, Sunday to Thursday at 8.05 p.m. Eastern. 
What you need to know, the news, fast and to the point, and the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat from the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown, co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David, every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. The trends, the fads, the breakthroughs. Get it all on Trending. From food, music and art, to advances in modern medicine. Meet the trendsetters and the tech giants who make it all happen on Trending with Emily Francis. Weekdays, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Forty years ago, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat made the trip that many never imagined would happen. In search of a lasting peace, he took a short flight to Israel and changed the Middle East forever. Join us as we take a look back at Sadat's historic visit and how his dream of coexistence is part of today's reality. Watch our special programming all day November 21st, only on I-24 News. a famous French field commander who said that it is much more difficult to show civil courage than military courage. And the president worked. As far as my historic experience is concerned, I think that he worked harder than our forefathers did in Egypt building the pyramids. <laughs> Yes, that was former Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who also had a sense of humor, not just bravery, taking this uh, Sadat visit uh, forward. And before we continue our discussion uh, in studio, let's bring you with the second part from former Israeli Ambassador Shlomo Hillel, remembering that historic visit and its uh, meanings. Take a listen. At the end of the Yom Kippur War, when we managed to overcome the first days of our failure, and we were on the way to, to Cairo, 101 kilometers, and all of a sudden, the Egyptians that didn't, were not ready to, to negotiate with us directly, and they said the three famous no's from the Khartoum conference, no recognition, no peace, and no negotiation with Israel, were ready and started to negotiate with us. So the real change, to my mind, has already taken place at the end of the Yom Kippur War, and then, when Begin came and said, I'm ready to give you back the whole of Sinai, this opened the way for the arrival of Sadat to Israel. And back to our studio panel now. Now, Dr. Karen, I began this conversation with you asking about public opinion in Egypt. But having listened to uh, Sean Combs, who joined us from Cairo, and our reporter Mike Wagenheim, both saying the younger generation now, not only do they maybe not have animosity towards Israel, they don't really care about this entire story. Maybe the same is true for Israelis. And in some ways, it's a good thing because there is no more that old animosity. Would you agree? I agree in a sense of there is no hostility that used to be with the older generation. And the curiosity, from my own experience, about asking about factual issues simply uh, when you need use a term, some kind of a terminology that we used to use at the time of the Arab-Israeli conflict, they simply don't know. They're asking us, and we have more than a million entrances to, the, to our website in the embassy. We have people that are working in order to enable the, uh, uh, the Egyptian young generation to ask questions, to, to inquire, to be in touch with us, and they do it all the time. And I, in my own experience, when I uh, used to come to a, to a, a, a bookstore, for example, and you know many students after graduating, they don't have a job, they're working all kind of jobs like taxi drivers or in bookstores and so on, and they used to develop conversations with me. And 
really wanted, eager to know what's going on and no hostility at all. So, uh, and as you know, Egyptian has a great sense of humor. So it's very easy to start uh, a nice conversation with people and they really want to know. So it's a matter of how they're defining and how they're following Firstly, the last seven domestic years in Egypt, and then how Israel is integrated in the region in that sense. So, Professor Pode, despite all that curiosity in Egypt and in Israel, one towards the other, what are we missing? What are we maybe doing wrong that this hasn't yet evolved into a full, for, full on peace? at least not in, in some advanced stages. It remains a cold piece, as the Prime Minister said. Yeah. Well, I think that, first of all, it's good to have um, a, a good perspective of the peace process and the peace treaty. Um, we are talking about the situation of war that developed between Israel and Egypt since 1948. Uh, uh, Egypt participated in a war. So until Sadat's visit in '77, we are talking about something like 30 years. Now, the peace is already 40 years old, so the period of peace is longer than the period of war. That is interesting because before 48, people tend to forget, but there were connections. There were uh, delegations of sport, there were delegations of teachers, uh, people came and visited one another. So the situation is that we have a longer period of peace now. The question is, as you asked correctly, I mean, why this longer period of peace is not developing into something warmer? And I think uh, that the answer is partially lies in our responsibility, partially lies in what the Egyptians are doing. So obviously, we cannot be responsible for everything. But I think that we should take every opportunity in order to try and improve the relations as far as possible. So and there's reason to be optimistic, Dr. Koren? Basically, yes. I believe that uh, we, are, we are defining the situation differently. The word Takbe, normalization, was a very, very loaded word in Egypt for a long time period of time, and by overcoming this, uh, disagreements, tensions, by more cooperation, mostly on a civil society, civil project and so on, by the time, I think we have a good reason to be optimistic. Yeah. And I believe we have still good reason to continue discussing, but you know what's coming now. Another short break and we'll be back. Stay with us. Tracy Alexander for I24 News. Join us on Perspectives and get the whole picture as we break down the day's top stories from all angles. Perspectives, Sunday to Thursday at 5.05 p.m. Eastern. Politics, economics, business and technology. Get the real news and the real insight about what's happening around the world. Michelle McCory breaks down the top stories of the day from the Middle East to the U.S. Weeknights beginning of extra parliamentary political scene that today goes hand in hand with official politics. Here's Rodan al in this next report. Forty years later, many still remember how astonishing and groundbreaking it was to see Anwar Sadat step off the plane in Israel in 1977. The Egyptian president came in a bid for peace after his country had spent three decades waging war on the young Jewish state, hoping to destroy it. He came, there was nothing, nothing. 
He came out from the war, from the cold, directly to Israel. And this is why he provoked kind of a, a dream for us. Sadat's historic speech at Israel's parliament was dramatic for a nation the Arab world had denied and maligned. We accept you. This is his words. We accept you. For Israelis, he could not said at that time anything more important. Tough negotiations with Prime Minister Menachem Begin followed, along with the tireless mediation efforts of U.S. President Jimmy Carter. In 1978, it bore fruit with the Camp David Accords and then the 1979 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. We can talk about Sadat's visit as the first major move of narrowing down the Arab-Israeli conflict from an existential conflict into a dispute over territory. More and more Arabs and Muslims recognize that Israel is there to stay. And as you know, there are all kinds of secret relations between Israel, not only Egypt, it's so secret, but Saudi Arabia, the Gulf principalities. The peace treaty also provided a pivotal turning point for the prospects of regional peace, even if the Palestinian track failed. You have a model for the first time that been implemented about how to translate Security Council Resolution 242, what that mean when we say peace. I think that uh, Oslo would not have been possible. No, it wouldn't. Oslo could not have been uh, negotiated and signed. I don't think so. The peace with uh, Jordan. Removing the military threat of Egypt allowed Israel to slash its defense budget and invest more in education and social welfare. Some argue the high-tech startup nation would never have started without the Egyptian peace deal. The IDF also won more liberty to carry out operations in Lebanon and Gaza without fears of Egypt joining the battle, a fact not lost on Arab critics. There are no few who would say uh, peace uh, with Israel allowed the Jewish state free hand to go against any Arab potential imagined or not imagined threat or enemy. But the limits of the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty stand out four decades later, a peace that is often described as cold, one that still hasn't reached normalization. Even until now, couldn't imagine Unfortunately, textbooks in Egypt and Jordan, who has real diplomatic relations with Israel, are full of anti-Semitic slogans. The hatred is so important, so important, that they cannot really go into it and decide, OK, let's see Israel exist. After all, uh, Israel is, is, belongs to the history of the Middle East. Many argue the people of Egypt will only accept Israel once the Palestinian issue is resolved. Israeli occupation or administration depends on your point of view of the West Bank. This kind of image of being an occupier, this is in the 23rd century. It's not acceptable. No more war, no more bloodshed. Sadat's historic visit no doubt broke a political dam, redefining Israel's place in the Middle East. But the work he started is far from finished. Jordana Miller, I-24 News, Jerusalem. And Jordana Miller joins our panel in studio now. Uh, Jordana, thank you for joining us and for that report. Jordana, I want to pick up on one of the last points made in your report, the empowerment of the IDF um, as uh, one consequence of that peace treaty. And as you say, this is something that has re resonated, continues to resonate with Arab critics of the treaty, of the relations between Israel and Egypt. Right. I mean, there is no doubt that the Israeli army gained a, a freer hand to operate uh, we had, you know, two operations in Lebanon. We've now had three wars in Gaza, even fighting the Intifada. Uh, and, and this is, you know, for the IDF, they suddenly didn't have to worry about Egypt really entering the battlefield. Uh, in some points, their criticism was muted, and other times it wasn't. But it's far different than actually having to confront, uh, you know, Egyptian tanks on the border and think that they're going to enter in. Now, for many uh, in the many 
many in the Arab world today still see this as a major problem, um, that there isn't anybody to kind of, even the United States, to to rein in the IDF when it feels it needs to go over, as Yoram Maital put so eloquently, imagined or real enemies. And Jordana, on a related point to the IDF and its uh, operations and its liberty to uh, conduct the operations it sees fit in the region, the Palestinian point, which we've touched on also uh, during these, this two-hour broad, broad broadcast, not a lot is said or not enough about how the peace process between Israel and Egypt, who some say is still ongoing, affected the Palestinians, Palestinian nationalism, Palestinian politics. Right. Well, it seems that almost every historian I talked to for this piece said there really would never have been the Oslo Peace Accords without the Egyptian peace deal. It set up the model for the first time for people to talk in detail about how to implement a peace, uh, a peace treaty, and in details of land, how we interpret resolutions at the UN 242. Um, and this is something that, you're right, doesn't really get enough attention. That piece, I really Really focused on Israel, but some of the things I didn't have time to talk about were the way that the Palestinian nationalism was influenced by the peace treaty. For example, in the in the agreements in the Camp David peace accords, there of course was a section that was supposed to deal with peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and in there it was discussed as autonomy. Now that was rejected by all sides for various reasons, but when the Oslo peace accords came along uh, later, there was an adjustment to the language which an autonomy is thrown out because it was rejected and still rejected today. And the use of the word sovereignty was put in there, which was a, a really a seismic shift. It's not, it's not a state yet, but we see that autonomy finally was, we could say, put in the trash and the trash was thrown out. Dr. Koren, on that point, as a former ambassador uh, to Egypt, uh, it seems to me, uh, while I was never in Egypt, not certainly uh, recently, but it seems that what's being conveyed uh, to us here in, uh, in Israel is that Egyptians, young Egyptians, don't really, are not very involved in the Palestinian issue anymore. That's true. I happened to be there in a war in Gaza in 2014 listening very carefully to the TV shows and for the first time it was very clear that very popular uh, TV uh, uh, hosts and, and uh, uh, sometimes very well-known stars in the TV criticizing very sharply the Hamas, not, not Israel. That was a very new to me to hear that. Uh, and uh, because usually before automatically the blame was putting on us. And that was interesting uh, to see. And in, just in addition to what uh, Jordana said before, not only the army had the uh, feeling that he, it can operate relatively in a very, very smooth way, but most of the very, very tight cooperation today it within the militaries, Egyptian and Israeli militaries, that promote the, the common interest of those two countries. So is it interesting? Having, but having said that, I don't ignore the fact that the Palestinians are a very important uh, factor in the relationship, both influenced by and also influence on the situation. And gentlemen, you're both staying with me to continue discussing this. Jordana Miller, thank you very much for joining Thanks. me to elaborate on that piece. We'll be right back with more on this Sadat special into the second hour now. Stay with us in one minute. We're back. In the Holy Land, there are wonders most people never get to see. I-24 News will take you inside the shadows and unravel the secrets of some of the world's most revered sites in a way you've never experienced. All access from every angle. Tune in to Sacred Sites 360, Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Stories. Stories that touch your heart and open your eyes. 
Stories that take you on a journey and show you something you will never forget. Look through the lens and see what others see. High Definition, documentaries and discussions that connect us all. Join Lauren Izzo weeknights at 10.03 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. es el magazine semanal de noticias y análisis en español de I24 News. Mi nombre es Carlos Gurovich y conmigo en el estudio Damián Pachter y Anib Azulay. Analizaremos todo lo que pasa en Israel y el Medio Oriente. También pondremos nuestra mirada en el mundo hispanoparlante. News24 es el magazine semanal en español todos los viernes solo en I24 News. back to this special on 924 News. We are looking at 40 years since Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president, landed here in Israel. And we've been talking about him in these past two hours. Now, let's see a profile of the Egyptian president, who some say continues to shape Israeli politics in this report. Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president who would change the landscape of the Middle East by making peace with Israel in 1979, becoming the first Arab country to recognize the Jewish state. Sadat was born in Egypt in 1918 to a family with 13 siblings. He graduated Cairo's military academy in 1938 and joined the Egyptian army. It was in Sudan where he met fellow officer Jamal Abdel Nasser. Together, Sadat and Nasser would form a revolutionary group called the Free Officers Movement. And in 1952, the group staged a coup that overthrew the monarchy of King Farouk. Nasser became president and Sadat began serving in various governmental positions. During the 1967 Six-Day War, Egypt would undergo a humiliating defeat at the hands of Israel, losing most of its military might and the entire Sinai Peninsula. Three years later, Nasser died and was succeeded by Sadat. But Sadat wasn't about to forget Sinai. In October 1973, he launched a coordinated surprise attack on Israel with eight other Arab states on the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. But soon the tide of war turned against them and Israel would emerge victorious again, recapturing the eastern bank of the Suez. Then, change was ushered in. For one, following the war, Sadat introduced his Intifah doctrine, or the opening the door policy, essentially Egypt's opening to the West. The significance was largely fiscal, replacing the Soviet Union as the aid giver with the United States, and changing Egypt's economy by encouraging both domestic and foreign investments in the private sector. In 1978, Sadat traveled to Camp David to begin negotiations with Israel, mediated by then U.S. President Jimmy Carter. The accord would have Israel return the Sinai to Egypt in exchange for Egypt establishing diplomatic relations with the Jewish state. The Land for Peace formula was created. Sadat took steps unparalleled to this day by any Arab leader when in 1977 he made a historic visit to Israel, where he made his famous address to the Israeli parliament. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. But shaking Israel's hand would prove costly. The treaty infuriated the Arab world, with news of the agreement sparking angry demonstrations throughout the Middle East. The outrage was particularly salient among Palestinians, with the leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, stating, let them sign what they like, false peace will not last. And in 1981, Sadat paid the ultimate price for peace when he was assassinated by members of an Islamist group opposed to his dealings. The doctrine of land for peace that was established with the signing of the Camp David Accords would prove monumental, as the entire peace process has relied on that formula for success ever since. But with decades of deadlock in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process and a war-torn Syria on Israel's northern border, some are posing the following question. Is Sadat's land for peace formula still relevant four decades on? Michael Pluchak, I-24 News. And, uh, uh, tell is Sadat's formula still relevant 40 years on? Back to our studio panel now. And Professor Pode, I had asked you earlier 
Prime Minister Netanyahu would make the same uh, step, take the same step as uh, Prime Minister Menachem Begin then did. But looking at current Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, also a dramatic difference, some would say, from uh, Anwar Sadat. Um, and a very different form of ruling as well. Uh, today in Israel, the view of uh, Sisi as well is complicated. Would you agree? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, the, the personality issue is crucial. We have to understand that. Because sometimes we as historians, we tend to, you know, to emphasize historical processes. And they are very important, but the personality uh, is highly important. If we go back, to that situation 40 years before, we find Carter, Begin, and Sadat. This is a very unique combination, a combination of uh, respected leaders, determined, and all of them had the legitimacy of their people. And that's very important in order to gain or to affect the situation as they did. Now, coming today to the personalities that are involved today, then uh, we have spoken already about Netanyahu, so about Sisi. I don't think that in terms of his uh, political style, Sisi is very much different from Sadat or either even Mubarak. Uh, this is an authoritarian rule, and this is the kind of rule in Egypt since at least 1952, since the revolution. So this is the kind of uh, rulership that Egypt is a kind of used to. It doesn't mean that democracy will not happen sometime along the way, but I guess, as Sisi himself said, it's still too early. It will take some time. But I think that uh, Sisi, in certain uh, respect, he is uh, completely different, is that he has the full command of the army. And Sadat, originally, uh, he was a free officer, obviously, but he didn't come actually from the army, and therefore that had some problems uh, in, uh, during his reign. And I think that right now, Sisi, at least he has the backing of uh, his army. Uh, it's a big question whether he has also the backing of the people, because, you know, the social and the economic situation today in Egypt is such that there are a lot of protests and there is a lot of criticism against Sisi. To a large extent, it's quite similar to the situation pre-Mubarak uh, revolution, but nevertheless, we are five, six years later, and the Egyptian people is quite frustrated from the situation, and he is very much in a position that he asks himself, what to bother? I mean, we went the whole process, is eventually we get almost to the same position. Um, I mean, Sisi is a kind of Mubarakism without Mubarak. And uh, yes, CC is a kind of Mubarak. I think that's a wonderful way to take us to that break. You knew there was another break coming. I'm not surprising you at this point. And when we come back from that break, we'll go to you, Dr. Koren, for more. And we'll wrap up our discussion uh, of uh, 40 years since Sadat visited Israel. There's a lot more to say, and we'll have more to say when we come back. One minute. Stay with us. Unflinching, opinionated. Weeknights, David Schuster and Shayna Estulin bring you analysis, interviews, and opinions that connect us to the Middle East and the world. Watch Crossroads weeknights starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Middle East politics has its own set of rules. In Israel and beyond, public figures play an elaborate game of cat and mouse with the media. We'll break it all down for you with our all-star panel of movers and shakers. The Spin Room with Ami Kaufman, Sunday to Thursday at 8.05 p.m. Eastern. 
24 News. to the Sadat special here on I-24 News. Now a special report, slightly different from what we've seen so far in these two hours. Born in Iraq in 1934, Barhum Ezra was expelled from his country of birth uh, with his family in 1951. Despite that tragic episode, uh, there is no bitterness in his heart, so he says he dedicated his uh, life to using music as a bridge to connect with the Arab world. Uh, and Hali Salam is an anthem he composed to celebrate Sadat's visit to Israel. Our culture correspondent, Daniel Campos, brings us that story. <laughs> In his mid-80s, Iraqi-born musician Barum Ezra may be a forgotten figure for most Israelis. But if you go to the Israel Broadcasting Authority and research his name, you will learn that this man wrote over 50 original Arab classical music compositions, some arranged for orchestras. Out of all of his compositions, there is an anthem which stands out. song that reminds us of the beauty of optimism, Hali Salam, The Peace is Coming, a composition specially made and played for Egyptian President Anwar Sadat in his 1977 visit to Israel. I was asked to compose a song for the peace process. We called it The Peace is Coming. We had it ready, and they told us, don't air it until the peace goes through. The lyrics were written by Abu Farid. I made the arrangements for Rafi's voice to celebrate Sadat's signing of the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. The song played on Egypt's radio station, The Voice of Cairo, and also played on Israeli national radio. The peace process with Egypt enabled Barhum to visit Cairo and meet Egyptian musicians and celebrities. It was during the normalization period. Sadat opened the doors of coexistence towards the Jewish people to welcome us. It was a beautiful period. Peace process with Egypt gave Barhum the hope that an eventual peace agreement with Iraq would happen and that one day he would be able to visit his country of birth and reconnect with his childhood friends. For now, Hali Salam remains his favorite peace mantra. <laughs> Reporting for I-24 News, Daniel Campos. Yes, a peace mantra, certainly something we could use more of here. Uh, Dr. Corin, before we wrap, your last point before we go off air with this Sadat special. I think uh, four decades of peace uh, definitely prove itself as a pretty successful uh, model for a relationship uh, in, the, in the region. And I think with all ups and downs, we have a reason to be... Uh, optimistic for improvement of the relationship and overcome obstacles that we have along the way. So if we'll be patient enough and open enough, I think with good relation we can promote things very nicely. Dr. P uh, Professor Pude, excuse me. First of all, Israelis don't have patience mm -hmm. in response. But I think that the major issue is that the peace is stable. And I think that a good indication was when Morsi came to power and all of us feared that suddenly he's going to abolish, to cancel the agreement, and it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because it's an Egyptian interest to keep the agreement. And therefore, it means that whoever is in power, he will probably keep the agreement. And that's the good news. The bad news is that we haven't got to the point where we want to be. And this is something that we have to work on in the next 
following years. And as Dr. Koren said, patience is needed. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me for this broadcast. And thank you for watching with us this Sadat special, marking 40 years since the Egyptian president visit here to Israel. Hali Salam, thank you for being with us.